So this particular research project started when we were looking at TLS, and in particular the new, the upcoming version, TLS 1.3. I guess since you all attended Brian's great lecture this morning, I don't really have to motivate what TLS is about. But let me just say, as a cryptographer, I envision it usually starting with the following, oh, the clicker doesn't work. With the following idea, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. Okay, great. Okay, so I assume that this here is my, my laptop computer and I'm going to access some, some secure website. So there is a web server and I want a secure connection between my laptop, my client computer and the server. But of course, there might be attackers that try to, uh, well, degrade my security, try to attack my connection. Well, actually, this isn't quite how the world looks like because there's about a billion of other people maybe using their web, web browsers as well to, to, to connect to web servers. There's mail servers using TLS, uh, database servers. There's embedded devices and sensors that use TLS to communicate their data to whatever service they want to communicate to. So the world looks a bit more like this. And actually, even that's not quite how the world looks like because there are adversaries that are not actually interested in breaking my specific connection, but they do mass surveillance. So they have um, huge capacities in storage and computation, and they do mass surveillance on the internet and try to attack, assume, well, we have to assume that they try to attack whatever they can. So let's have a bit more of a closer look to uh, TLS. So from a like, 10,000 foot perspective, TLS looks like this. It starts with, a, with one protocol phase, which is usually called the handshake and uses asymmetric cryptography. And the role of this is to create a symmetric key, which is shared between the two parties that uh, take part in the protocol. And they use this key in the second protocol phase, usually referred to as the record layer <laughs> protocol, um, to protect the actual payload data. And this is based on authenticated encryption, in TLS 1.3 at least. So uh, in particular, it's nonce-based authenticated encryption, and I just want to remind you what that means. It means we have two algorithms, an encryption and a decryption. Uh, both obviously take the key, the encryption takes the message, and an additional message, the nonce, and as long as the nonce is unique, um, this is going to achieve some good notion of security, which I'm going to explain in, in a minute, but the important property is we want this nonce to be unique. We don't need it to be random. This is a deterministic algorithm, and the nonce just has to remain unique until we switch the key, then we can reuse the nonces. The decryption also takes the key uh, and the nonce, and also, of course, the cipher text to generate a message or maybe an error symbol. So we want confidentiality, which means uh, the cipher text shouldn't tell you more about the plain text than maybe the length of the plain text. And we want integrity, which is usually described as if you don't have the key, you won't be able to come up with cipher text that is going to be accepted by the receiver. So, TLS in principle can use different types of non-space authenticated encryption, but the one that is kind of in the pole position to be used in most connections is AES GCM, which I've tried to draw on this slide. So there are some important properties here. First, the key to the authenticated encryption is going to be used as a key to the AES block cipher, and it's used only there, okay? So whenever we use the key, it is to key AES. The nonce, TLS only uses 96-bit nonces, and for those nonces, GCM will work as follows. It will take those 96 bits and append another 32 bits before it, uh, 96 bits and 32 before it gives them to, to AES. And basically, this part of the scheme here is then just a counter mode encryption that starts at the nonce, okay? Over here, we just evaluate AES with a key that we got on a all zero bit string. This is just to generate another like uniformly random value, which we are going to use as a key in, in a hash function. So this here is an almost X or universal hash function. It's based on finite field arithmetic, but that's not important for us today. And uh, basically what we do is we hash the cipher text that we computed. We computed it uh, here using counter mode, meaning we XOR the message blocks to, to the uh, output of the block cipher. And uh, we hash this, and then again apply another like mask value that we obtain from AES to uh, to obtain the last block of cipher text. This here is basically a MAC. So you can think of this as being an authenticate then enc uh, sorry encrypt then MAC scheme with counter mode and a uh, almost extra universal hash function based MAC. 
So how would this be used in TLS? How would TLS use uh, authenticated encryption to predict the data? So first of all, there's two directions, one from the client to the server, one from the server to the client. They use completely independent keys, so we can focus at them independently. I'm only talking about one direction on the following slides. And um, the goal of TLS is to, to actually transmit a, a, like a sequence of messages. Okay, so client and server may communicate for some time, and we want to communicate those messages in a sequence. It's a sequence of byte, stream, uh, byte strings. So what we would do then is uh, we use the authenticated encryption, of course, with the key that we got in the first phase, uh, the message that we want to transmit, and the sequence number uh, of that particular message. So we count the messages and just use the sequence number to encrypt the message, use that as a nonce. And of course, like the nonces are 96 bit longs, so they're not going to overflow. So uh, this value is going to be unique and it's going to be a very good nonce. And as long as we're in the kind of the single connection domain, we only look at the security of, the single con of a single connection, this is a perfectly good scheme. Okay, but now, so this is all discussion which happened on, like, uh, before our research project even started. So I'm basically just recapping this. There is a possible attack that a very computationally and storage-wise powerful entity could run, and this is as follows. I'll, I'll quote the first part of AESGCM here, okay? So I'm going to look at the first of the encryption of, of the first block, of the first message of the channel. Now the first sequence number is all zero, so the first nonce we use is all zero. So the nonce that we input here uh, turns out to be actually 126 uh, zeros, then a one, and then a zero. I don't know why I put a two here. It should be one zero. Um, and also, let's look at the output here. Because for most protocols, for example, H if, you, if you encrypt an HTTP connection, the first uh, message that the client is going to send to the server is going to, to, be, uh, is going to be HTTP get and then a URL and a version. So we know what this plain text is going to be. The same holds for almost like any other protocol that is specified, they start with some kind of header information which is fixed. So by just looking at the traffic, we will actually be pretty good in predicting the first blocks of the plain text, okay? So when we attack a connection, we can just assume that this isn't there, we can kind of uncompute this and uh, get the output that must have been used um, to encrypt that part of the plain text. And now if you are a very powerful entity with a huge storage and computation center, maybe in the desert of Utah, then you could have the idea to compute a huge table for this input, okay? And this table contains some huge selection of keys, however much you can store, and the corresponding output of the block cipher using that key on that input. Okay, and now if you, once you see a connection, you try to compute this, uh, this output value by, by kind of predicting the header value that is encrypted, and you look up uh, in, your, in your table, you look, the, you look up the key that might be used in that connection, and you might have the key. I mean, there may be several keys or so, but there's a pretty good probability that if you find the key that it's actually the correct one. Now, is this attack realistic? So, let's make some bold assumptions here. Maybe the, the NSA can store two to the 64 of those rows. It's probably a bit more than they can actually store, but it's not too far away. Then we have some billions of devices that run TLS sessions every day, and by just assuming each of them runs 100 sessions, we arrive at pretty much two to the 40 sessions. Okay, so AES has a 128-bit key, so we still have a security margin of something like two to the 20 one in a million chance. So is this really a problem? Well, I'm not sure, I'm kind of undecided because on the one hand, it's, the NSA is going to see one purely random connection, so most likely a picture of a cat or something like that. Um, but on the other hand, I've not used any particular property of AES. Maybe they know something about AES where they can slice off some additional bits and they can store a bit less or they can, uh, I don't know, optimize this attack in some way. And then it becomes kind of close to being uncomfortable. Right? It becomes kind of close to being, they can actually break connections. Okay, so what the TLS working group then did is they said, well, a very important property of this attack is we all use the same value here because if we wouldn't use all, the, all use the same value, we wouldn't be able to pre-compute that table. Okay, so let's just not all use the same value. Instead, let's add some kind of a randomizer here 
and randomize the nonce before we actually give it to AES. Okay, so they're giving a random value, 96 bits, random value, uh, that they don't change during a connection, so they choose it basically when, at the same time they, they get the key, it's actually derived from the same uh, key material. And uh, they just use what I explained before, it's just randomizing the sequence number with this nonce before they give it to, to, the, uh, to the authenticated encryption. And now there are some obvious questions. The first one is, well, formally, what did they want to achieve with this? Second, didn't they, did they achieve it? And third, if they did, or if they did not quite, can we do it better? Okay, the answer to the first question, in our opinion, is what they want to have is kind of multi-user um, authenticated encryption security. So authenticated encryption security where we do not only care about the security of one connection, but of the, uh, we care about the security of, of a multitude of connections. Then we show that actually this TLS countermeasure can be seen as kind of building a new authenticated encryption scheme from the one we started from. And finally, we analyze uh, in the model that we, we provide in the paper, the plain AES-JCM, then the mode uh, that is proposed in TLS 1.3, we will call it RGCM for the rest of the talk. And um, also we are going to propose a mode that is called XGC, that we call XGCM, which is basically GCM uh, using AESX, where AESX means uh, we apply a mask before and after uh, using AES. I'll show that on one of the next slides. Two important uh, things here. One is all the statements are in the ideal cipher model, and for the purpose of the talk, we focus on key recovery security. The main reason is it's a bit simpler, and uh, the full authenticated encryption security is basically do the same as for key recovery security, and then standard AES GCM analysis, so you wouldn't learn anything new if you're at the AES paper, uh, GCM papers anyway. Okay, so those are the schemes. And on one slide, kind of what we show is that in GCM, uh, basically if you increase the number of users, you're losing what you would expect by the hybrid argument. Okay, and our GCM achieves something which is better. So basically, you start at the same security for a single user, but then your security degrades a bit slower. And XGCM, the one that we uh, described, basically it has, it has just better security overall, so we also increase this or improve the security in the single user case, and that kind of goes on for as many users as, as you want to have. Okay, so let's first talk about uh, multi-user key recovery security. So we formalize this as a game where we give the adversary, well, for now, three oracles. The first one allows him to create new user instances, and the, uh, the only thing that happens is there will be a new key sampled in the game. Then we give it an encryption oracle using the instance they choose, supplying a nonce and the message, obtaining a ciphertext, and accordingly, a decryption oracle. They can, again, choose the instance, um, the nonce and the ciphertext, and we return whether it was a valid ciphertext or not, and the goal of the adversary is uh, to guess one, any one of the uh, honest user's keys. Okay, so if there's one key which the adversary guesses, he won. This is kind of why it's multi-user security. As I said before, all we do is in the idea cipher model, an idea cipher, you can see it as basically a family of uniformly random permutations indexed by this key. So for each key, you get a uniformly random permutation that you can query uh, forward or backward, whatever you want. Both the scheme and the adversary have access to this idea cipher. Basically, we formalize it as an oracle that can be queried by the scheme and by the adversary. And it idealizes block ciphers such as, for example, AES. So the full uh, multi-user key recovery security model in the ideal cipher model looks as follows. We have the same three oracles as before, and now we also have the, the oracles to, uh, to query both directions of the ideal cipher. The goal is still to guess the key. Okay, um, I'll have to speed up a bit. Um, so let's now look at the multi-user key recovery security of GCM. So the proof idea is as follows. All the proofs we do follow this uh, same structure. First, we kind of, we have the idea cipher here and here, so the, the states of these oracles are kind of entangled. So the first step is going to be then that we say this is almost the same as if we were using a different idea cipher here and here, 
And this is where the main part of the proof uh, actually occurs. And then once we did this, these oracles are of no help because they ha don't have any correlation with the rest of the random experiment. So, but also remember that the key is only used as a key to the idea cipher, nowhere else. So the actual value of the key never appears in the game. So what, your act what the adversary actually has to do is he has to guess one out of u, where u is the number of users, uniformly random keys, and overall he's going to, to resolve this or to, to solve this with a probability u over two to the kappa, where kappa is the length of the key. Okay, now in a bit more detail. Um, you can envision the idea cipher as follows. It's basically a table where we have the keys here. So each key describes one column, each input describes one row. And assume that the user used these, or the honest user instances used these two keys now we're in the step where we want to detangle these oracles. I should have explained this before, okay? So we're in the first proof step where basically we want to show that these are irrelevant and we want to replace the idea cipher that is used by both sides by different idea ciphers. The only way for the, for the adversary to detect this is to basically make a call to the idea cipher, which is a call both here and here, and see that there's a difference. Otherwise, he's just going to get like independent values. Okay. So the only way he can do this in that case is by guessing a correct key of a user, okay? So he will guess one of these, whatever number of users we actually have, rows. And the probability for him to do this, you can, I mean, it's, it's a probability theoretic computation. We have to do, so it's, it will end up to be u times p, where u is the number of user instances, p is the number of ideal cipher queries of the adversary, over two to the kappa. Okay, and once we have done that, we are in the step that basically uh, we can replace the two idea cipher, the one idea cipher by two independent ones, and we can use the same argument as before. And the overall probability that we're, or the overall advantage of the adversary that we get is u times p plus one. This is one from the guessing the key uh, over two to the kappa. Okay, we show an adversary strategy that actually shows this bound is pretty much tight. So f this is a small constant, it's probably like one over 10 for realistic parameters. And otherwise we get the same, we, we describe an adversary strategy that basically just implements uh, what I've explained on the very, uh, on one of the first slides, uh, which just checks, um, which encrypts the same value with the same nonce and then just does this recomputation. And uh, this adversary strategy will pretty much achieve uh, the, the bound that we gave for this game. So now let's look at how we can view uh, the RGCM scheme as an authenticated encryption scheme. Basically, we view the randomizer as a part of the key, and then we just, inside the scheme, so this uh, dash box shows RGCM, we just XOR it to the nonce, okay? Now it's an authenticated encryption scheme as before. It just uses a longer key. Okay, and now um, we follow the same proof structure as before, but it's going to be more intricate because now we cannot give up once the adversary uh, just guessed one of the honest keys we used because otherwise we would end up with the very same bound as before. So we look at what our GCM actually does and basically the, the parts of the ID cipher used by the honest guys, they look somehow more like this. So for one key, this is one user instance, um, there will be patches in here, right? Because this, it's basically we do a uh, counter mode encryption so we use some part of the idea cipher that, that is uh, kind of continuous, and this is one message, this is one message, this is one message, and so on. And now we can do a similar argument as before. We can count the adversary queries, we can uh, count basically uh, the number of queries done by the honest users, and uh, estimate what the probability of the adversary is to actually guess in one of those regions, okay? And now this is u times number of users times number of adversary queries times uh, basically the, the um, area of these uh, patches. And, but now the overall, um, the denominator here becomes bigger because we don't only have to guess one of the rows, we have to guess one of the row and column combination, combinations of one of those red patches. Okay, that's why we get improved security here. Okay, but we also have backward queries because uh, the output of the uh, cipher is not uh, randomized. Uh, we can basically just view a part of the cipher text or the adversary can take a part of the cipher text, which is an output of an AES block, and try to uh, basically uh, 
invert the uh, random permutation, invert AES, and try to figure out uh, the sets, uh, figure out the keys by this. So if we look at the outputs of the idea cipher, so this is now the back, the inverse direction, uh, basically it's much more sprinkled out. So it's some random, we, for each key we see some random ciphertext here. Okay? And now we can, the adversary can guess any one of those lines and can try to find a key corresponding to this, but in contrast to the very first uh, attack, this doesn't scale anymore because most likely if he sees some ciphertext block, it has been used by one or only a few users. So whenever he does an inverse query to the block cipher, he's going to attack only a very few number of user keys. So the attack doesn't scale as it did in the first, okay? So this ends up to be a small constant times p over two to the kappa, but this is independent of the number of users. Okay, is that all? And the answer is unfortunately no, but I have to be quick on this. And the reason is here, this, this uh, query to, to uh, the block cipher is not randomized. Okay, so we cannot replace this dependent idea cipher by a completely independent one at this step, unless we also make this part here independent. But this is one fixed input to the idea cipher that the adversary can easily give as well. So this is just, is, uh, this, we have to take care of this in the proof, and we basically do this, uh, so this is also why the proof I show here only holds for, um, for passive adversaries that do not use the verification oracle. Uh, we do this by basically saying, um, we do this XOR here, so we, as we kind of change the distribution here a bit, um, gathering some error in the, in the security bound uh, to be uniformly random, and then you don't get any information about this value here whatsoever. So that's how we deal basically with, with uh, this stupid query. So that's your wall bound. It's pretty complicated, but uh, what I want to highlight is we have u times p here, which was the problematic term, but the denominators are pretty big. And here with the smaller denominators, we do never have u times p. We have p's and u's, but only additions. So these terms are much, much smaller. And that's why, so these are kind of for, for uh, the actual security, these are very relevant and they don't, like they don't grow with the uh, hybrid argument linear growth. Okay, we, we show, but we show that this term here, for example, is necessary, so there is an adversary strategy that actually works on inverting particular ciphertext outputs or ciphertext parts, and um, the bound is, that part of the bound is tight. Okay, I'll just um, explain that this here is basically X A or AESX, so, uh, this is another part of key, like 128 bit of randomness, which we use to mask the input and the output of the block cipher. And so this entire scheme is what we would call AESX GCM. Okay? And the idea here is we can basically use the result of Killian and Rogaway, who analyzed, uh, well, they analyzed DESX, so used in DES. Um, we have to kind of adapt it a bit to the multi user setting, and then we basically get indifferentiability of the construction and querying the component from these two independent ciphers, which is exactly what we are going to need in our next proof. Uh, so that proof is actually being a combination of this indifferentiability argument together with the proof of JCM. And we see that this bound is much nicer and also much, much better than the proof of, uh, than the bound of uh, our GCM, and it holds for all types of also uh, active adversaries. So uh, the authenticated encryption scenario uh, or security is basically the same, one minute, wow, okay, uh, is, is uh, basically the same as standard authenticated encryption with multi-users, so we have the new oracle and various instances in encryption and decryption, and we are in the ideal cipher model, so we give ideal cipher, okay? And the results that we obtain there are basically, this is the reapplied for GCM, so this is the key recovery term, and these terms all stem from the analysis of AES GCM, standard analysis, single user model, and so on. So that's how then we uh, obtain all the actual authenticated encryption security. Okay, I'll have to stop here. So I just say thanks for your, uh, for attending my talk.